I'll start with the, the, the performance of the business and, and, and where you see it heading from here. Clearly, Refinitiv has been a big part of your story over recent years. I know it's early days, but I wonder if you can tell us what advantages are you already starting to really appreciate? Well, first of all, we've had, we're re reporting our results this morning, we've had a very strong uh, 2020 uh, with total income up 6%, a strong performance across our capital markets business, our post-trade business and our information services business. Really pleased to see that given what's been going on over the past year with uh, the pandemic uh, and the challenging working environment. Uh, to your point, we're very excited about Refinitiv uh, joining LSEG. We closed on the transaction now about five weeks ago. Uh, and that's a terrific business to have uh, as part of LSEG. We are now uh, a truly global company with substantial presence in the Americas, in Asia, across Europe and, of course, in emerging markets as well. Uh, it gives us multi-asset class capabilities. Uh, we were uh, a major player in equities before. We now have a st substantial presence across fixed income and foreign exchange as well, so a multi-asset class capability. And, of course, now we're, we're one of the leading providers on a global basis of financial market uh, data, analytics, and workflow. So really excited about the combination and excited about the path forward. OK, uh, excited about the path forward then. Let me ask you about the path forward uh, that we've heard a little bit more about in terms of listing rules for the London market, listing rules here in the UK. We've heard from Jonathan Hill's report that has to be digested by the FCA. They want to consult by the summer or have a cons consultation paper out by the summer. Do you think that this is going to move fast enough? I think that uh, the more quickly it moves, the better. <clears throat> but right now, there is a, a pretty clear message uh, to issuers, to investors in this market that uh, London is very much focused on being uh, the most attractive listing destination it can possibly be. And what, what we have seen in recent years is that there has been a bit of a change or uh, an evolution in some of the listing uh, approaches in other markets. And the, the regime in the UK hasn't changed. Uh, so what that has meant is that some companies that very much wanted to list here were tempted to look elsewhere because of things like the free float requirement at 25 percent, because of the inability to have dual class share structures uh, in the premium segment. So I think with the Hill Review's recommendations to adjust some of these, I think that only makes this market that much more attractive. Uh, in some cases, companies will, I, I think, uh, list now and soon, because uh, the time is right for their corporate evolution. And they may have an opportunity to take advantage of some of the changes in the listing regime as they come in over the coming months. Because of some of the things you mentioned there, some of the changes that might come through then in London, David, uh, some have expressed concerns about investor protection. Do, do you share any of those concerns? I think that the Hill Review recommendations struck a very good balance in terms of uh, making some reasonable changes while at the same time maintaining the highest standards of corporate governance. And for example, on dual class share structures, uh, to have a sunset provision where uh, the dual class share structure is only used in, a, in certain ways, in certain uh, votes, uh, and then sunset. So after a, a certain time period would go away and uh, would go back to a one share, one vote concept. I think that's a, an excellent approach uh, to balance the interests of a founder who wants uh, his or her company uh, to have the opportunity over their first few years of being public to really meet strategic ambitions, uh, but at the same time balance the interests of investors. So th there, are, there are ways to make these changes while at the same time maintaining very, very high standards of corporate governance. And I think the Hill Review has done a, a good job in striking that balance. We've seen plenty of traditional IPOs this year, David, uh, in London and, uh, and elsewhere in, in Europe and, and globally. We've seen plenty of SPACs as well. Clearly, that's part of the Hill Review. Do you think London risks being a little late to the SPAC game? I think the way to think about SPACs is uh, that they are a useful tool in the capital markets toolkit. Obviously, there's a lot of focus on uh, SPACs in the U.S. market at the moment, and there's been uh, some concern expressed about the froth in that market in the U.S. And so uh, I, I think it's important that uh, the U.K. market moves down this path in a careful, thoughtful way. I think there are some uh, aspects of the rule regime 
uh, that could be changed. So, for example, when a SPAC announces a transaction uh, to avoid the suspension of trading, uh, that's the issue that keeps uh, this market currently from uh, being a, an attractive SPAC market. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's important uh, that it is only one of many tools in the toolkit uh, for investors. And we'll continue to see uh, the traditional IPOs in this market, uh, but I think it's also helpful uh, if we have a regime uh, in adjustment of the rules where, if it's mm. appropriate, uh, investors can use SPACs. If London should move carefully down that road, David, what about the road to cryptos? Your predecessor, Xavier Role, has said that London should also embrace cryptocurrencies. Is London doing enough on that front, do you think? So we have a number of offerings uh, in the uh, crypto space on the data side. I would say in terms of trading of crypto products, that's an area where uh, we will really take guidance from the regulators. And I think uh, that to the extent there are uh, government-backed digital currencies or government-backed uh, digital products, uh, that is something we would look at very, very carefully. In the current environment, uh, with some of the concerns, both regulatory uh, and um, in terms of how investors may be treated uh, in crypto markets, uh, that's, that's an area that we would be very cautious about. OK, on to another subject, one that we've talked about a lot here on Bloomberg TV in recent years, and that is the, the post-Brexit environment. I wonder how the LCH clearing business has been performing, how much business has moved as a result of, uh, of Brexit? <laughs> And with respect to our clearing business, uh, we have seen no discernible change uh, in movement. Uh, volumes continue to be uh, very strong and, and, if anything, growing, including growing from uh, EU domiciled market participants, uh, the members and, and the clients in Europe. It is a global liquidity pool uh, and uh, interest rate swaps. That's, that's the area that has uh, gotten a lot of focus. Uh, has uh, continued to be a very dynamic space as we see uh, continued discussion around uh, potential return of inflation or reflation. Uh, we are seeing more activity uh, in terms of um, financial institutions hedging, corporates hedging, uh, and so there's a healthy amount of activity in our interest rate swaps. But to answer your question, uh, the business is doing very well across swaps, uh, across repos, credit derivatives, uh, and equities. All of those different asset classes benefit from uh, activity and volatility in the markets. And those businesses continue to grow. We have not seen any uh, shift of business in clearing uh, out of uh, LCH mm. li in, into uh, other clearing houses. OK, uh, and we've seen, of course, the EU grant some limited clearing uh, privileges to the UK. And uh, but, but, but more generally, the conversation around equivalence is still very up in the air, David. And I wonder what you make of that. We've heard from HSBC that it's important. We've heard from um, uh, various insurance businesses that I've spoken to have said how important it is. And yet we hear from Jonathan Hill that he doesn't think that broad equivalence is coming. How important is that equivalence conversation for London? So let, let me be specific about the equivalence for clearing. Because of the, the systemic importance of clearing, uh, the EU has granted uh, temporary recognition so that our business, uh, LCH, can continue to serve EU domiciled market participants, EU member banks uh, and other financial institutions. Now, that today is uh, what is referred to as temporary recognition. And that temporary recognition uh, lasts through June of 22, <clears throat> so next year. And this has been a, a bit of a cycle over the past few years as the European Commission has granted temporary recognition to LCH to continue serving EU customers uh, for the last several years. Uh, that is because there's a recognition that our services are systemically important, really important for uh, EU customers. We look forward to continuing to engage with the various stakeholders in the EU. That's the, the customers and the members. It's ESMA, the European Securities Regulator, that directly regulates LCH. It's the ECB. Uh, it's the regulators uh, and the governments in the region. Mm. And we look forward to having an opportunity to uh, get permanent recognition uh, when that temporary recognition expires. 
but it, it's an yes, ongoing discussion. It's been going on for a few years. Yes, and that, that temporary uh, 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 rule does expire, as you say, June 2022. But I wonder on the broader equivalence conversation for London, given the conversations that you must have as CEO of the London Stock Exchange, how important do you think it is more broadly that we get more equivalence? I, th I think a more equivalence is helpful. Uh, we at the London Stock Exchange Group are generally in favor of less market fragmentation uh, and freedom of capital flows across borders. I think that's better for our customers. It's better for markets, uh, particularly as we look forward to a, an economy that can recover from the pandemic over the last year. Uh, to have uh, countries and regions turning inward uh, is not helpful and will not facilitate an economic recovery. So uh, I think that a, a having greater uh, flows of capital, and if that's um, the result of uh, equivalence, that would be a better thing. But uh, in terms of LSEG, uh, we are fully prepared for uh, whatever may come. We are a globally diversified business. We've set up parts of our business. We have turquoise in Europe now. Uh, and so when some of the trading of EU securities moved to Amsterdam, we were fully prepared for that. And it actually, a lot of that moved to our venue in Amsterdam. So uh, equivalence would be a good thing. Uh, I hope that the, uh, the governments and the politicians that are involved in, in working through this can uh, get to the right place in terms of equivalence. Uh, but if there is not equivalence, then uh, we will continue to carry forward. And our business is in excellent shape. And we look forward to continuing to grow in uh, our markets all over the world.